Morning, everyone. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but, in, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree be bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears the, these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught us, he, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their, as their teachers of the law. Amen. Well, good morning. Let me add my welcome uh, to you this morning. Please turn back in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 7 as we conclude uh, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' conclusion on that ser from that sermon is where we're going this morning. Uh, this afternoon, as Ray said, we're going to be thinking um, in, in our uh, afternoon meeting about assurance. And rather than do a Bible quiz interactive Bible study, what I thought would be more helpful, just to have a time of sharing. If someone, if, if you would like to share how you came to know the Lord, that would be very helpful. If you've got anything that you'd like to share about how the Lord's been dealing with you and, and what he means to you in, in this situation you're going through, that would also be good because we can then spend time in prayer and praise for one another as we uh, walk along the road to life. So let me pray. And then we'll get to work uh, looking at this passage. Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. Please grant in Jesus' name that every one of us in this meeting and those watching online will know that they can say, I personally know I have entered through this narrow gate. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Yeah, that's the text, 7.13, enter through the narrow gate. A gate, by the way, is an entrance to another world. A gate is an entrance to another world. For example, if you are flying, if, you if you're going on holiday to a chosen destination or a business trip to a chosen destination, what you have to do is get to the airport. You then have to wait for your gate to be called. But if you do not enter through the specified gate when it is opened, you will never get to your desired destination, will you? And every gate has a gate keeper. Um, some of you will be aware that I traveled to Serbia uh, last month. My, my pastor and I traveled to Serbia. We were told that we had to be at London Heathrow Terminal 4 by 9.30 in the morning. And then we had to wait, get our boarding card, we had to wait until gate 19 was called. 
And then when we went to gate 19, we'd already got our boarding cards on arrival, but the gatekeeper checked our pass, my passport and my boarding card before allowing me on the plane. Every gate is a, is a door, is an entrance to another world, and every gate has a gatekeeper. And notice how Jesus concludes this Sermon on the Mount, as he calls all of his hearers, enter through the narrow gate. What does that mean? It goes on, he goes on to explain, look at verse 14, this is the road that leads to life. Verse 14, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only if you find it. It also means, as he says in verse 21, to enter the kingdom of heaven. To enter through the gate is an entrance to life. It is also an entrance to the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So there is no more important gate to enter than this narrow gate that Jesus sets before us and summons us all to enter, is there? But notice alongside the Lord Jesus' invitation for you and for me to enter his narrow gate, he includes a very serious warning. For wide is the gate and broad the, is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Let me just say, as we um, waggle on the tea a bit in this introduction, one of the objections to Christianity to Bible-believing evangelical Christianity, is its claim to be exclusive. When Jesus says such things as, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6, and Acts 4, 12, and there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Christianity say, say that people is too exclusive. How can you say that there's only one way to heaven? But the Bible's answer to that objection is that the gospel invitation excludes only those who exclude themselves. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you are, that are labour and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And even this text itself in John 7, uh, sorry, Matthew 7, 13, dispro disproves that Christianity is exclusive when he says, invites everyone to enter through this narrow gate. But in Jesus speaking of the wide gate and the broad road that leads to destruction, he is not, I am convinced, comparing and contrasting paganism or any other ism with authentic Christianity. Nor, let me push on this, nor is he comparing and contrasting religion with authentic Christianity. I take what I what I am convinced of as I've meditated on this passage this week, I am convinced that Jesus is comparing and contrasting counterfeit Christianity with authentic Christianity. Where do I get that from, you say? I take it from his warnings regarding false prophets that he mentions in verse 15, and that how we are to recognize them by their fruits, verse 16, verse 20. I take that also because of what he says about those who say, Lord, Lord, and have a very impressive CV to point to on the Day of Judgment, 21 through 23. And also notice in the wise and foolish builders, there are subtle but hugely significant differences between the wise and the foolish builders. And Jesus makes the point that on the face of it, both houses look the same. Both builders notice, hear, Jesus, hear, hear these words of Jesus, verse 24, verse 26. But only the wise builder puts them into practice. So my contention is that Jesus is deliberately comparing and contrasting fake Christianity with authentic Christianity. And why does he do that? I think the reason is, I would suggest, is obvious. And this is just this, that Jesus is showing us 
that we can be easily deceived and deluded into thinking that I am a real Christian, whereas in reality, I have entered through the wide gate and I am on the broad road that leads to destruction. It is a terrifying reality that there can be two people in this church service this morning singing the praises of God, saying amen to the prayers, hearing the very words of Jesus, and one of you has entered through the small gate and you're on the road that leads to life, and the other of you has not. Rather, you've entered the, through the wide gate and you're on the broad road that leads to destruction, and you do not know it. False assurance is utterly fatal. So there is no more urgent and important need to, than to know 100% certain that you have entered through the narrow gate and that you're on the road that leads to life. So how can you and I be unshakably sure that we have truly entered the small gate and are on the narrow road that leads to life. Put it another way, how can we be unshakably sure and gain the genuine assurance of our salvation? The assurance of salvation is a huge theme, and it is of vital importance to us as Christians. And this doctrine is um, spoken of in all of the New Testament Gospels and in all of the letters. For example, Paul deals with it very specifically in Romans chapter 8. Um, and when he concludes about the witness of the Spirit, the Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. Second Peter, the big deal of Second Peter is to make our calling and election sure. That's in 2 Peter. And the Apostle John in 1 John wrote the whole book, the whole letter is written so that we may know that we have eternal life. And so Jesus, at the commencement of his worldwide mission, does the same thing as he concludes this Sermon on the Mount. And he also gives us signs, the hallmarks of the genuine believer, alongside the telltale signs of the false. So what are the hallmarks of the genuine believer? And there are five of them, and they are, and they're in the outline on the, on the, on the What's On this week. According to Jesus, genuine, narrow road, life-bound believers have a personal experience, verse 13 through 14, a discerning spirit, verses 15 through 20, a humble heart, verses 21 through 23, a wise life, 24, 27, and a new authority over them, 28, 29. Now, there's, a, there's enough here in this material that Jesus has given us to drown an elephant every week. What we're going to do, though, is just, I want to basically fly over the surface of this and highlight the big deal that Jesus wants us to grasp. So let's think this through a personal experience, verses 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus is here speaking of the beginning of the Christian life in terms of entering through the singular narrow gate, which means, which must mean for every true Christian, they have a personal experience of entering this new life. Now, for each Christian, how you entered through the narrow gate will be different and varied. Every experience of the new birth is different and personal. And indeed, every natural birth is unique and personal. There are no two conversions that are, that are identical. Some people come to, to, to faith in, immediately. Others are on a journey and gradually their eyes are open. It's like, it's like the guy that Jesus healed who was born blind. Mud, spit, what do we see? I see men as trees walking. Mud, spit, oh, then I'll see it now. And some conversions are dramatic and uh, it, you know you can point to the time others to others are over time but there are common experiences that will accompany every and every person who's entered through the narrow gate and as i say we hope to hear some of your experiences as we share together this afternoon now when jesus describes in his introduction to the sermon on the mount these are some of the things that will be evident 
there will be a poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Chapter 5, verse 3. In other words, nothing. Absolutely, I'm utterly bankrupt before God and I know it. There'll be a mourning over your sin. Chapter 5, verse 4. There will be a hungering and thirsting to be made right with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 6. And the other famous passage on the gate is in John chapter 10. You need to turn there just to make a few points about it. It is Jesus himself who calls you by name to enter through that gate. And in John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus himself says, I am the gate. And this is in stark contrast to the wide gate and the broad road with many entering. It speaks of just going with the crowd, just keeping up tradition, merely going to church. So let me ask you, what is your personal experience of hearing the Lord Jesus call you by name and you responding to him in repentance and faith and entering the kingdom through he, he who identified himself as the gate? Personal experience. Secondly, a discerning spirit. Verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears sorry, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every fruit that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So here is the Lord Jesus speaking to those who have entered through the narrow gate. And he urges us and warns us to watch out for false prophets who look like sheep, sound like sheep, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And over time... Because fruit is never instant, is it? Fruit takes time to grow. But Jesus says, over time, you will see their true colors. And Jesus assures us, he, prom he makes this promise twice over, verse 16 and verse 20, by their fruit you will recognize them. Now, this warning to recognize false prophets the New Testament speaks repeatedly on this theme again, and it is always from the, in, within the context of false prophets arising from within the church. False prophets arising from within the church. Jesus himself spoke about this in the final teaching section of Matthew in 24 through, for, uh, Matthew 24, 4 through 5. The apostles, every one of them, speaks about it. The apostle Paul in Acts 20, 28 through 31, even from among your own number, men will arise to distort the truth. It's, in it's actually why Paul wrote 1 Timothy to the church at Ephesus, because those that prophecy had literally come true. The church at Ephesus was replete with false prophets. It's why he wrote Galatians. That's why Peter also wrote to Peter, chapter two, 2 Peter chapter 2. It's all about this subject. And 1 John, again, he wrote about the subject and, told, and called them antichrists. And Jude wrote about the same thing. And we see this multitude of false prophets has literally gone viral in our day and generation over the internet, as well as in churches across our city and across our nation. And these false prophets are successfully calling many to join them on the broad road that leads to destruction. But Jesus promises that those who are on the narrow road to life will have a spirit to discern and recognize wolves in shepherd's clothing. So let me just give you a quick snapshot of what are the distinct what is the distinguishing fruit of wolves in camouflage. In a nutshell, they deny that Jesus is the Christ. That's the bottom line. And they do so in two ways. They deny that Jesus is the Christ um, in terms of their message. 
That's the point that John makes in 1 John 2.22, which means they sow doubts about the person and the work of God's Son as he has revealed himself to us in the Scriptures. You will have heard the name of Steve Chalk, no doubt, who defined the crucifixion as the Son of God and in terms of how the Scripture reveals that Jesus bore the wrath of God in our place on the cross that we've celebrated, Steve Chalk calls it cosmic child abuse. That's a false prophet. Rob Bell, a very um, influential Bible teacher in America, wrote a book called Love Wins, Denying the Doctrine of Eternal Punishment. So they, the message, right, they are denying that Jesus is the Christ. Their lifestyles, secondly, deny that Jesus is the Christ and the sovereign Lord of their lives. Let me just read you two passages, 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has been long hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Jude verse 4, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people, who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. The sex abuse scandals that have come to light within the professing Christian church and leaders in the professing Christian church have brought the way of truth into disrepute, have they not? The blasphemous decision by the Church of England Synod to bless same, so-called same-sex marriages is bringing the way of truth into disrepute. But Jesus warns us of all of these false prophets ahead of time, and he promises to his sheep, his people, he will give them a discerning spirit. He will give them a discerning spirit through his spirit dwelling within us, through his word revealed to us and by pastors and teachers that he has gifted to us to explain God's word to us. That's how we know. So let me ask you, do you have this wolf discerning spirit from Jesus? A humble heart, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not perform, prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. These statements that Jesus makes are rightly terrifying and at the same time wonderfully comforting to the true child of God because as well as false prophets arising from within the church, Jesus tells us here clearly that there will be fake Christians who end up facing him on the day of judgment. And Jesus shows us how convincing they are to others and indeed tragically to themselves. Their faith is orthodox and emotionally satisfying. I get that from the repeated phrase, Lord, Lord. Always in, what, so they are addressing Jesus as Lord. They recognize him as sovereign, Lord. But the double naming in Scripture always speaks of an emotional connection. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Martha, Martha, said the Lord Jesus to Mary, to, to Martha. It always denotes an emotional connection. So their faith is orthodox, Lord, and it is emotionally satisfying, Lord, Lord. And their ministries are theologically accurate and socially redemptive. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Theologically accurate and socially redemptive. 
did we not all in your name? Jesus tells them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Why? Why? Because they are trusting in themselves for their salvation. There is a sense of pride in pointing to their theological convictions and their qualifications from Bible college, no doubt, and their personal achievements. Did we not? But according to Jesus, they have not done the will of my Father who is in heaven, verse 21. That's the, the, the distinguishing mark is that you have done the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the will of God, God our Father in heaven? Jesus, John 6, 29. Jesus answered, the work of God or the will of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Which means to recognize how spiritually bankrupt you are, how vile you are, and how much you need Jesus to be your saviour. And recognizing that without him you can do nothing. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And to joyfully embrace the truth that your only basis, your sole exclusive basis for entering the kingdom of heaven is, as Alistair Begg says, because the man on the middle cross told me I could come. That's the exclusive means by which you will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a humble heart. There's nothing about self. It's all about him. So is this a portrait of your heart? A wise life. 24, 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that, beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Notice how strikingly similar these houses are, and these houses are a picture of the lives that we are living, and more importantly, of the hope that we have. Both houses look alike, do they not? Verse 24, verse 26. There's no, on the surface, any distinguishing features about this house versus that house. They look identical. Both builders hear the words of Jesus, verse 24, verse 26. Both houses face the same test, exactly the same tests, verse 25, verse 27. Jesus is emphasizing here that it is a tragic reality that you can go through life looking like a real Christian, sounding like a real Christian, thinking you're a real Christian, and be self-deceived and end in destruction. Because verse 25, only one house survived. Why? It was solely because of the builder's decision on where to build his house. One chose to build his house on the rock. The other chose to build his house on sand. Let me give you an example. Two men go to see their doctor. They have the same doctor. Both undergo tests and examinations, and both men are diagnosed by their doctor and by the medical team they go to. They're both diagnosed with a fatal, a fatal but treatable illness. Both men are offered the treatment regime, but only one man is wise and takes up the offer of the, the doctor's diagnosis and the prognosis and the treatment. He takes up the offer of the life-saving treatment. The other waves it off, nah, I'll be all right, I'll, I'll take my chances. Now, which of those patients chooses life 
and which one chooses death. Which is, why, which is what Jesus means by telling us the wise, putting these words of mine into practice. It means you take his words very seriously. It means you internalize his words. It means in the prophecy, in the word of, in the word of Isaiah, you tremble at his words. His words challenge you. His words confront you. His words convict you. They humble you. And praise God, they lead you to the rock that, that was crucified on Calvary for you. So you build your life, you invest all of your hope, all your trust in the foundation of the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary for you. So which kind of builder are you? And finally, a new authority. Look at how the sermon is, look at how Matthew concludes the sermon. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The acid test as to whether we are fake or genuine Christians is how we have responded to Jesus' authority. That's right throughout the entire scriptures, and it's particularly emphasized in Matthew's gospel. It is all about, in a sense, the message of Matthew is all about Jesus having all authority. The final com great commission, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Me, says the, says the risen reigning Lord Jesus Christ. And I would argue from Scripture that the acid test of true saving faith is joyful amazement at the attractive power of the authority of the Lord Jesus. There's an amazement in these people who hear Jesus speak. There's, it's, not, it's not an authoritarian authority, is it? It's an incredibly attractive authority. It's a, it's a winsome authority. It's a loving authority. It's a fulfilling on your behalf all the things, that you, living the life you could never live and dying the death that you deserve to die. Is your reaction to Jesus' authority the same reaction as the crowds? They were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. Do you share their amazement at his gracious and loving authority as your king? and of your saviour can you look to as a personal experience uh, have you got a discerning spirit have you got a humble heart are you living a wise life are you joyfully bowing the knee to the lord jesus as the supreme authority over you and you're on the narrow road you're on the road that leads to life may god make that true of every one of us for his name's sake and for your everlasting joy let us pray. Father, we thank and praise you that the Lord Jesus has done everything uh, for us on our behalf. And he's given us, you have given us, Lord, your word. You've given us yourself. You've given us your spirit. And you've given us one another to encourage and build us up in our most holy faith. Grant that everyone in the hearing of the, my voice will know for sure and for certain that they have entered through the narrow gate and are on the road that leads to life. For Jesus' sake. Amen.